Greetings, ladies and mantle gents, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales from Outer Space. Space. And as always, I hope that you enjoy the Terran Incident, written by Mr. Nailbrain75. Extract from Terrans, Ignoble Savages, or Incredible Pioneers, written by Professor Anther Stratmont, University of Versia Publishing, 3210, Second Edition. Introduction. For many centuries, our galaxy had enjoyed a long-standing peace. Despite the odd small-scale planetary insurrection or political disturbance, order and serenity was kept and maintained by the will of the Kajaxian supremacy. From humble beginnings as a race of traders, the Kajaks had grown to prominence during the events of the Great Maiari Civil War, also known by some historians as the War of the Maiari Princes which occurred in the year 1765 of the Kajakian calendar. Footnote. For clarity's sake, I'll be referring to all dates using the Kajakian calendar, as this is one of the few chronologies to be adopted by multiple cultures throughout the galaxy. Following the death of the Maori Sultan Dakesh the 20th, his three legitimate sons all gathered their forces to fight for the right to rule the planet. Whilst wars for succession were rare, they were not unheard of, and, as a result, the Kajaxian Maiari Company, KMC, deployed its own private army to secure and defend its assets on the surface of the Maiari homeworld. It was during this time that the princes, after having seen KMC forces fight off larger raiding forces of bandits that had come together to take advantage of the conflict to plunder and loot the surrounding settlements, began to pay off the Kajaks as mercenaries. Throughout the conflict, the KMC would hire out its security forces as mercenaries to the highest bidder, all the while hiding behind a thin mask of neutrality, which allowed them to keep trading with all parties. After all, each of the three claimants was aware that to directly attack the KMC was not only to permanently lose a highly valued service, but to also risk bringing the Kachaxian government into the war. By the end of the Civil War, the KMC had all but established itself as one of the dominant powers on Maiari. Even had we wished to do so, the newly crowned Sultan Takesh XXI was not in a position to deny aid from the Kachaks, as his own resources and military forces had been decimated as a result of the conflict. Attempting to remove the KMC from power would not only nearly be impossible, but would likely deny him vital supplies offered up by the Kachaks. And so, the KMC were here to stay on Maiari. Over the next 50 standard years, the KMC influence began to grow. Despite the wishes of the Sultan, KMC military forces only continued to grow on Maiari, aiding in putting down rebellious factions and providing greater security. Meanwhile, the aliens all became to dominate the Maiari markets. By the year 1812, the Kachaks controlled Maiari in all but name. In 1815, the Sultan took Creed II would sign the Treaty of Bry, making the Maiari a vassal planet to the Kachaks. Some historians and contemporary politicians pointed how convenient the death of Sultan Dakesh XXII and all of his children as a result of a warp drive explosion was to the Kachaks, as Kachaks XXII had been vehemently opposed to meddling of the offworlders in Maiari affairs, whilst his brother, Turkri, had... Uh, who had been a long-standing advocate for the Kajaks, had conspicuously taken ill on that day of the voyage and subsequently been the only member of the royal family to survive. The Kajaks have denied any and all involvement in the incident, and with no evidence to the contrary, as tends to happen in warp drives explode. For further reading, I highly recommend Graktar Mok's book, Interstellar Disasters That Shook the Galaxy. I'm afraid... We must agree with the investigation, which states the destruction of the Royal Cruiser as nothing more than a tragic accident. After all, even today, the Maiari are not exactly known for their shipbuilding. That's covered throughout Mork's book, in which they have four entire chapters dedicated to the various mishaps. Expansion of the Kachaks Following the success in Maiari, the Kachaks began to expand into other systems. In their early years... They followed similar models to Maiari, wherein which they would make themselves all but indispensable to the various governments. Worlds allied, and the Kachaks soon became rich and powerful. 
It was through the trade in uranium ore and slaves with the Kachaks that the reptilian Kaudata became the major galactic power that they are today. Other worlds that tried to sanction the Kachaks for their actions both militarily and otherwise found themselves blockaded by the Kachaksian navy until they acquiesced to the demands of the aliens, often to the great expense of the blockaded world. The Sindran, even now, 348 standard years after the end of the blockade of their homeworld, have yet to recover. As their power grew, the Kachaks began to expand ever outwards and began to outright invade and conquer worlds that could not resist them. As recorded in many historical texts, their first major campaign of colonization against the insectoid Yin was a major success after storming the Nikor Hive, which resorted in the capture of the Yin Queen. Their second campaign against the amphibian Odin was famously achieved in the span of four standard months in the year 2431, leading to total domination and enslavement of the Odin. The third campaign all but annihilated the raiding fleets of the Drexit that had terrorized the southern edge of the galaxy for many, many years. And so it went on. The infamous blue coat regiments of the Kachaks were respected and feared far and wide. Of course, they were met with resistance as many alien races sought to prevent complete Chaxian dominance. This famously led to the formation of the alliance of Boga, Slack, and Druk to oppose the Kachaxian supremacy in the year 2702. The Supremacy War would rage for the next two and a half centuries and would see fighting on eight separate worlds. Despite the valiant efforts of the Alliance, the Kachak's military was far superior, having perfected the art of firing their muskets up on top of astonishing four shots a minute and having perfected the art of forming their ranks so as to perfectly meet the enemy's attack, no matter the situation. Only the famed Druk cavalry was superior to the Kachak's counterparts and this advantage was lost to the Alliance when the Druk defected to the Chaxian supremacy in 2927 in exchange for full rights in the supremacy as citizens and to be pardoned from paying the reparations for the war, an agreement that the Kachaks, to their credit, honored completely. When the final Slack outpost fell in 2951, and so often depicted in various media such as the brilliant film Alliance, and the not-so-brilliant death of a dream. The Kachaxian supremacy's dominance was all but secured. It seemed that through trade, guile, and unstoppable military power, the Kachaks had gone from being a simple merchant world to the leader of the greatest empire the galaxy had ever known. The 293rd Expeditionary Fleet and the Discovery of Terrans for the next 71 standard years, the Kachaxian supremacy controlled the galaxy. All known life in 40% of the galaxy woke up, lived, and died under Kachaxian rule. Yet, still did the Kachaks seek to expand their influence, and so sent out multiple expeditions into the unknown regions of space. At the beginning of the year 3012, the 293rd Expeditionary Fleet stumbled upon a Category 9 world, Although, on the edge of what many races considered to be habitable, this world was possessed not only life, but sentient life. Initial monitoring of the planet's crude communication systems determined that this was likely only a few colonies of a species that was only beginning to reach out to the stars. What would drive any sane species to try and settle on a Category 9 world, only one class beneath the dreaded Category 10 death world, with such primitive instruments, was beyond comprehension. It was not understood at the time that the colonists hailed from one of these Category 10 death worlds, and to them the planet named Janus, reportedly after one of the ancient gods, was a verdant paradise that was in fact being used to farm various foodstuffs. Yes, these creatures were farming and consuming the various poisonous fauna and flora of the Category 9 world. For their homeworld, Terra. Having spent one week out of range of the primitive scanners of Terrans, Fleet Admiral Lord Blom ordered the world to be seized in the name of the Kachaxian supremacy. In a lightning strike, the world of Janus was seized, having been deemed primitives. The Terrans were rounded up and put into slavery. Out of the five space-bearing vessels of the colony, three were destroyed in the initial strike, while in orbit, and the fourth was destroyed attempting to escape the world. Only one ship, 
The UNSS Explorer would escape the campaign, and only because Lord Blom's sense of martial honor felt that there would be no glory in hunting a fleet vessel. Had the 293rd Expeditionary Fleet spent more time analyzing the culture of the Terrans during their initial reconnaissance, they might not have allowed the Explorer to crawl back to the Terran space. But as the Admiral's lust for glory of a quick campaign, he only allowed three standard days for recon before invasion. The captured Terran slaves were brought back to Kachaxian space to be sold, where they gathered quite a lot of interest. Being a newly discovered species was not the only cause of this. The Terrans were bipedal, ape-like creatures, their soft skin buried in various shades of whites, beiges, browns, and black. Although short compared to most other species, standing at merely 5.5 kicks on average, they weighed as much as a fully grown Kachaks male with the strength to match. This led scholars to speculate the Terrans had evolved on a high-gravity world. This would later be confirmed. This made the Terrans ideal for manual labor. Furthermore, the Terrans were mammalian in origin, and their hair was soft and almost luxurious to the touch, which, if gathered in large enough quantities, might make for an excellent fabric. It was also guessed that Terran milk might also be better alternative to that of the back kick beast, which is all but inedible to up to 142 different species. These were all factors that made investors and government officials to fund more expeditions into Terran space to conquer their race and put them into slave farms as had been done before to other races such as the Slack. In late 3014, Lord Admiral Blom was preparing his armada and his invasion forces on Janus when a Terran fleet of 16 ships dropped out of warp. Rage of the Terrans Initially, the arrival of the Terrans was surprising, but not concerning to Lord Admiral Blom. He speculated that the Terrans had sent all their ships to retake their colony, which would make the conquest of Terran space all the easier. Furthermore, were he to capture Terran ships, his one failure during the initial campaign, he would be able to learn the location of the other Terran worlds. Eagerly, he sent his ships to engage and ordered his infantry to prepare to any Terran landings. Lord Admiral Blom had failed to consider two vital factors. Firstly, due to the surprise of the attack, his initial invasion hadn't encountered any Terran military resistance before. Secondly, the starships encountered on the Janus Conquest were colony ships with little in the way of defensive weaponry, not the purpose-built dreadnoughts approaching him. The Kachaxian fleet raced towards the Terrans, Sleeker and faster, the Kajaxian vessels easily outpaced the lumbering behemoths of the Terrans. Like stinging bloodflies, the Kajaxian ships fired their batteries at the dreadnoughts. It was undoubtedly the more aesthetically pleasing of the two ship designs. Blom's plan was to have his ships fly past the Terrans in a straight line to provide a virtually continual broadside barrage. It was a strategy that had served the Kajaks for centuries. Then... The Terran ships fired. Although they were slow, lumbering bricks compared to the sleeker supremacy vessels, the Terran dreadnoughts also hit with the force of an angry god. The first ship to understand this was the KSS Enduring Spirit, which was torn apart in mere seconds under the hail of gunfire. Three more ships were destroyed in quick succession before Blom ordered the ships to break formation. The power of the Terran guns made it all but impossible to get within range to engage them. Unperturbed, the Terran vessels began to settle down upon the surface of Janus. As the Terrans landed, the 214th Kachaxian Blue Coat Army formed ranks and expected to receive the charge of the Terrans. The Adians might have used brute force to great success against the Kachaxian fleet, but here, yeah, it was expected the tide would turn. After all, Terrans were deemed primitive savages and were expected to run screaming towards the blue cloak lines the moment they discharged their muskets, as had been the case in so many wars against other primitives. It was here that the legendary 120 kick range of the Kachak's firearms and their famous four-shot minute would win them the battle. Drums played to the march of the troops into battle as news cameras played to the entire supremacy to show the glory of this victory. Indeed, the Terrans were, and arguably still are, savages. But it is not known to what extent. If it had, the supremacy would have likely ordered the quarantine of Terran space. 
You see, the Terrans have had a long warrior history. Through studying various Terran sources, I have learned that since the dawn of their civilization, the Terrans' tribal tendencies, aggression, and competitive nature meant that until coming to the Kachaks, the humans had not experienced more than two standard decades without war. So much of their technological development came about due to conflict. Early Terran spaceships were designed from the basis of Terran weaponry. See the V-2 rocket in diagrams. When most races invented the rocket, usually in the form of a firework or experimenting with chemical powders, they said, I wonder how we can use this to go faster. When the Terrans invented the rocket, their first thought was likely, I wonder how many people I can blow apart with this. As a result, Terran weaponry became ever more advanced. Terran culture is so based upon war that much of their media tells stories of war. Even their sports and games simulate war with sports that encourage unit cohesion to score a goal. See football in the references. Whereas they have computer simulations that replicate battle scenarios with genres dedicated to being a single soldier, FPS, and leading an army, RTS. The Kachaks may have been masters of war, but the Terrans revolutionizing it. And the Kachaks were about to learn this. Instead of coming in a mindless horde, the Terran infantry moved in small, mobile groups. This unnerved the Kachaks officers, but still they waited for the Terrans to enter the 120 kick range of their muskets. Then, uh, the Terrans stopped at 300 kicks and raised their weapons. Surely, they couldn't expect their weapons to be effective at that range. Then, the Terrans fired their weapons, firing not one, two, three, or four, but hundreds of rounds a minute, mowing down the blue coats as the tight ranks prevented quick escape. Worse still came the Terran tanks, monstrous armored cannons that tore apart the troop cavalry that charged to meet the Terrans. Worse still, the Terrans wore dark green clothing that helped them blend into the trees and made it all but impossible to spot them at extreme range of their firearms could engage at. Understandably, the Kajak's forces panicked and began to flee. General Vukger and his staff of Kahak's nobles waited for the Terrans to approach. Understanding that they would likely be captured and ransomed off as was customary for the nobility. When a squad, the name given to a small group of Terran soldiers, approached the general staff, Vukga and his men were brutally gunned down in a hail of fire that until an hour previous was thought could only be produced by a thousand soldiers firing at once. Only the cameramen of the new station have survived, unwittingly relaying all that was transpiring to a horrified galaxy. In orbit, the situation was far worse. Lord Admiral Brom's armada lay in tatters, with various captains deserted, warping their vessels back to Kachaxian space. Undoubtedly fueled by rage, Blom ordered his flagship KSS Victorious to engage the Terran ships, determined to take down at least one. The KSS Victorious drew into range. The Terran ship's UNSS Odyssey fired a salvo, detonating the Kachaxian engines and leaving Victorious adrift. Using a harpoon-like device, the Terrans anchored the two ships together and sent their squads aboard. Within the span of an hour, the ship was under Terran control. Various reports detail how Lord Admiral Blom committed suicide as was the honorable way out, and to prevent himself being captured. Others say that one of his slaves took his opportunity to, in a moment of hesitation on Blom's part, seize the Admiral's pistol and discharge it into Blom's cranium. The Battle of Janus resulted in 20,541 bluecoats, 34,702 naval personnel, and 18 battle cruisers being lost in the span of a single day. Worst still, the Terran casualties numbered less than 150 personnel, and extensive damage to two of their dreadnoughts, although this was able to be repaired. And with the capture of the KSS Victorious and its crew, the Terrans had access to all the data available on the supremacy. All this was broadcast live to the galaxy. Yet, we still had to see the Terrans' most feared weapon. Retaliation Galaxy-wide panic and riots broke out as the carnage of Janus was shown. Many blue-coat regiments were deployed to quell the crowds. Meanwhile, the Kachaxian government sat down to discuss the situation. 
it was clear that the Terrans had been underestimated. Perhaps when the entire might of the supremacy was brought against him, the Terrans could be overwhelmed by sheer force of numbers. Never in the history of the supremacy had a force been beaten so thoroughly. It was then that the sirens blared over the world of Zixus Prime and the Terran fleet appeared in orbit. The supremacy could hardly believe its luck. Zixus Prime was one of the main military staging grounds for the Kachaks. Over 75 battle cruisers were stationed in orbit, and one million bluecoats were waiting on the surface. Meanwhile, the Terrans had a mere 20 vessels. If there was anything that would halt the Terrans, it would be here. It was then that the Terrans opened communication. A middle-aged Terran male with blue eyes that seemed to bore through the camera faced the supremacy officers. He wore what appeared to be a captured auto-translator about his ear. This is Admiral Callum Harker of the United Nations Navy. In response to the unprovoked attack of your uh, supremacy, the Terran said this word with an audible sneer. The United Nations has decided to deliver upon you this ultimatum. Release all human captives to us and surrender yourselves to our terms. You have 24 hours to comply. The countdown appeared on the screen with unknown symbols that began to count down at regular intervals. If you do not answer or we perceive any act of aggression, we will be forced to take drastic action. The message terminated. The Kajaxians were outraged. How dare these savages try to dictate terms of surrender to them? Immediately, and perhaps foolishly, the Kajaxians moved to intercept the Terran fleet. The Terrans responded by simply firing six shots. The Kajaxians have dubbed these weapons the Brutos Hellfire after the vengeful god of war from ancient times. My own people, the Ferritus, named them the end of all things. The Terrans simply call them nukes. Six shots were fired out and streamed past the approaching fleet and slammed onto the surface of Zixus Prime, using information from the records of the captured crew and computers of the KSS Victorious. The Terrans had learned the positions of the most vital strategic targets on Zixus Prime's surface. Shipyards, factory cities, major forts, and staging grounds. In mere seconds, each was engulfed in nuclear fire that vaporized everything around them in atomic fire and leaving the scorched earth ruined for decades afterwards with the taint of radiation. The Terrans had weaponized nuclear energy. They weren't just savages. They were madmen. Once more, the Terran Admiral appeared on screen. That was your final warning. Do not make us do something we might regret. As the communication cut off once more, reports abounded of Terran fleets appearing above six other worlds along the border. All of them showed signs of bearing the same weapons as had just been unleashed on Zixus Prime. But this time, they were pointed at non-military targets. Citizens panicked and began to revolt. Ships began to evacuate people off-world, and in many cases, entire blue coat regiments deserted or even mutinied against their betters. If it had not been for a limited range of the Terran ships, it is likely that they would have gotten as close to Kachax as they possibly could. The supremacy had no choice. In his fateful address to the public, Minister Elson announced that all Terran slaves to be immediately returned to Janus. In the following 3015 Treaty of Janus, the Supremacy was forced to respect the sovereignty of the Terran space and was not allowed to send ships of any kind into Terran space without an armed escort. The trading of Terran weapons to aliens was also strictly prohibited. This proved to be the death now for the Supremacy. Sadly, many worlds who had suffered under the control began to rise up, sensing weakness. No longer did the Kajaks appear to be an unstoppable force. They had been made to bleed, and if something could bleed, it could be killed. Whilst the Kachaxian legions had been able to put down the odd rebellion at a time, their forces suddenly found themselves under increasing pressure as more and more systems rebelled against them. By 3031, the Kachaks pulled back to their homeworld and were shattered. The once rulers of the galaxy were beaten down and enslaved. In the intervening years since, the worlds formerly under Kachak's control had been working to re-establish themselves, and we've been forming new bonds and alliances. There have been conflicts, but there have also been great triumphs and breakthroughs. 
Yet every single one of us looks with trepidation to the western border. For, although the Terrans currently seem content to colonize worlds most sane sentience would not even consider, we remember what happened when they decided to fight for a world. Even though they are content to train with us, we remember the weaponry they keep hidden. Even though there has been no major conflict between Terrans and any other known species since the Janus War, we all remember the time the Terrans broke the oldest and largest empire the galaxy had ever known in less than two years. We all remember the time the Terrans went to war. And we pray that they are not given cause to do so again. End of story. Just a quick shout out to the T5 peeps. Bob the Dragon, Cat Crab Lobster, Data Magnet, Dark Machine, Mezic, Try Again 95, Feudic Yol, Astrea the Dreamer, Caspar Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Athelia, Meridian 117, and Jordan Buxmorm. Thank you very much. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. There are links down below both to support this channel and for the author of this fiction. Anyways, I hope you all have a fantastic one, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.